I am going to talk to you about individualized content at web scale, which is another long and very uninteresting sounding title. Uh, I hope that the talk is actually more interesting than the title is. Um, so, a few words about me. My name is Michael Schiefermeier. Um, my handles are MSCHAE, which is very, very close to what Martin Schuler has. So, uh, I might look into another programming language where he is in the world. Um, I have a Ruby background, recently fell in love with Elixir, and till last month I was a senior software engineer at Bleacher Report. Uh, Bleacher Report is the second largest sports website in the US, and um, this talk is still about what we did there, and I hope um, that I can convey some of the things and what some of the um, problems that we had there uh, to you guys. Uh, last month I started my own company uh, with a couple of friends, and um, Due to the experiences that I made at Bleacher Report with Elixir, all of our backend services will run and are running in Elixir and Phoenix. So uh, that's the first testament to uh, how much uh, we were blown away by it. Uh, a couple of disclaimers on up front. Um, I have a Ruby background. I saw that a lot of you guys do, do uh, have the same thing. Um, so this talk might contain, contain traces of Ruby. Uh, I will uh, compare a little bit uh, my experiences to the uh, experiences that I have in Ruby on Rails. Um, not everything that I'm going to present is live yet. Uh, we have um, a couple of things that are yet to be released, um, but most of the code that I wrote and that this presentation is about is actually in production. And lastly, uh, this talk is not full stack. What that means, well, this talk is full stack. It's not very uh, detailed on the code level. It's not very technical. What I want to do is I want to um, tell you guys what experiences, and girls, I'm sorry about that, uh, what experiences we made with uh, Elixir and Phoenix um, and what problems we encountered and how we addressed them and how we solved them. Um, it is targeted more towards um, people who haven't as much experience with it, although I hope that some of the things um, that we learned and the way that we solved it will actually be very interested to more experienced engineers as well. Um, first, let's talk about the problem domain. Let's talk about the product. So at Bleacher Report, uh, we have this, which is Team Streams. Team Streams are a, a list of um, content items to a sports team. So for example, right here you can see San Francisco 49ers, which is a football team, the football that you play with your hands for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> sorry, I actually have a couple of colleagues of uh, Future Report and friends here who, are not, who didn't laugh about that. Um, it contains a list of tweets and articles. The articles are either Future Report content or content from other uh, websites around the web. And then we have tweets and Instagrams in there that are being automatically and live fed into that tweet, uh, into that stream. Um, so you have like an experience of all the different things that you have on the internet. Um, that's per team, but in the mobile apps, in the iPhone app that you're seeing on the right-hand side of that screen, um, the start, start page is actually um, a merged list of all of your different teams that you're following and some other content as well. And that's where it's getting interesting. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, just keep that in mind. So the start page of the mobile apps actually contain merged list of teams. So this is again a stream, as you can see, you can get pretty long. Um, we actually don't delete stuff, so if you keep scrolling down, it keep, keeps loading more stuff. And it's what I just said, so merge streams of tweets and Instagrams. We've got both desktop and native apps. Um, we also have streams for leagues, divisions, teams, and stuff like that. And I still say we, so just go with that. Um, yeah, and in the mobile apps and also on the desktop, you can subscribe to different teams and they have an individualized experience if you open up those, uh, those apps. Oops, that was one too many. Uh, status quo. So uh, how did we used to do things at Feature Report? Uh, first, the lots of bold print, so uh, lots of requests. We're dealing with uh, a five digit, I wasn't able to show numbers, but we, we're dealing with five digits amounts of requests per second. Uh, so there's a lot of traffic hitting our servers, and the way that we traditionally solved that problem was with two monolithic apps. We had one monolith, and then we started an API project and became another monolith, so that was great. 
Um, but we recently started introducing multiple services to uh, extend that architecture. And we're breaking more and more out into microservices um, so that we um, are going to end up with a microservice architecture. And the product that I'm going to show to you today is actually one of those services. Um, we did everything on Ruby on Rails, like me, uh, Ruby background, Rails background, uh, Ruby on Rails has served us very, very well. We have some Node.js, but you can see it's a very fine print because we don't really use it all that much for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to go into to, to not uh, get too much JavaScript paid on me. Um, persistence layer, so we script store everything in relational <coughs> databases, MySQL and PostgreSQL. And if you did that at scale, you know that we have to have caches on top of caches, caches on top of caches. Um, if you are handling that many requests, um, and no matter how good and fast your databases are, if they're relational, they won't be able to keep up with that. So we cache everything. Now, keep in mind those streams, I'm going to go back to that in a minute. Um, a very good question came up. Uh, I was in Berlin for the Manic Factory, and I talked to the Martins. And uh, one of the Martins asked me, why don't you do caching? Like, why, why go away from that? Um, it works really well. There's actually a couple of good reasons to do caching, especially if you use CDNs. Um, and you bring the content closer to where the user lives. So if you're in Australia, you don't want to do all the network round trip to uh, Virginia, where our server lives. So caching is a good thing, right? Why not, why not go with that? And um, why Elixir? Well, the most honest answer to that question is I saw Elixir, liked it, I wanted to use it. Um, I, the, the app that I'm talking about doesn't have a persistent connection. It's not a chat app. It's not a game app. All of these things that you heard about today are very prototypical examples of how and when to use Elixir. Well, I was out of luck because my app is not like that. It's a very standard web app. Requests come in, I do something, and I respond. So why, why am I choosing Elixir for it? And why don't I keep this caching strategy that has been serving us really, really well? well to quote Phil Carton, there's two hard things in computer science. I bet nobody has ever heard that one. Uh, cache and validation and naming things. And cache and validation is uh, the crux of this problem. Um, the brochure benefits of addiction, the one that you see on the website that Jody likes to talk about that actually makes a lot, make a lot of sense, is it's is scalable. It's fault tolerance, it's a functional programming language, and it supports metaprogramming. That was news to everyone here, right? Um, turns out when you want to introduce a new language and you have a big product team and people who are in charge of you, uh, that doesn't bode too well. <laughs> They're like, yeah, all of these things are great and fault tolerance and all that sounds interesting, um, but our apps are actually pretty fucking stable, so why do we need to change anything? Well, for the problem that I just showed you, those merged lists, those highly individualized content, we can't actually catch that. The thing is, there's a couple of big teams, and a lot of people subscribe to them, like the Miami Heat, for example, or, or LA Lakers, or best football team on this planet, I'm talking about actual football here, Borussia Dortmund. Um, <laughs> the thing is that no two users of our apps subscribe to the same team. That's a little bit of a lie, you might actually find two, but it's very highly dispersed. So, uh, especially in the US, you have your college teams in there, you have different places where you live, and these combination of teams that users subscribe to are hardly ever the same. Now, that pretty much prohibits caching. Because caching only works in remembering a response to one of the requests and then replaying that response. You can't do that with individualized content. <coughs> Obviously, there's like some caching you can do in between, and it might be a good idea to do it. But if you are compiling these lists that have to be very fresh and have to be individualized on a per-user basis to over 80 million users, then you can't go ahead and just preempt all the different list combinations that there might be and cache them. Well, you possibly can, but I wouldn't recommend trying that. Um, there's another couple of reasons to, to use a language like Elixir for what we've been using for what we've been doing. One of them is, turns out that functional programming languages like linked lists. Uh, it's a very good data structure to use in a functional programming language, and those lists you've seen are linked lists. So the data st structure pretty much encourages you to use a functional programming language. Um, 
If you look at that start page again, or if you keep that in mind, there is multiple lists of multiple teams that you merge. Um, we have users with up to 50, 60 different teams they subscribe to. So what you have to do is you go build all of those different, these different lists, and then you merge them. Turns out that a distributed language like Elixir lets you do that in parallel. And I'm going to keep hammering that point at all, so just um, the next few slides are all about that. Um, like I said, we have an extremely high dispersion. No two users have the same stream. Every stream looks individualized per user. And we have like a requirement to, in the future, enrich those streams too. So for example, if you click one team more than the other teams, we might want to promote that team content on the start page. So we're actually going to go ahead and individualize even your own list every time you visit and incorporate your usage behavior. So I hope that I made a good point, at least it's about it convinced the superiors I had at Peter Report to use something that allows us to do it in real time rather than cached. Now, even for in real time, I could have used a couple of other languages like Go, and I, I looked at it. Um, but everything I saw about Phoenix and Elixir made me use that product and that stack. And um, I'm going to tell you very, very specifically why I love it so much and why I think it's the right decision and why I decided to have a talk on this. So, first off, if you do something in Ruby, um, there is some way to maybe do a little bit of concurrency every now and then, but it doesn't really work. And I think uh, that's not something that I've proved to you. Uh, so the classical sequential approach to the lists that we are building would have been to go to one database, build a list, go to the next, build a list, go to the next, build a list, and then the end, merge all of these lists. So basically, even if you make everything really fast, the fastest response you can give to a user is like the combination of all of these list builds, right? Well, this is going to blow away all the earlier people. We can do that in parallel. Um, we can read from different database slaves at the same time, build all of these lists in the same time. I don't care how many teams you subscribe to. If it's 100, I'm just going to build 100 lists at the same time. Um, I'm just going to feed all of that uh, to the merger and have the merge stream. And then another thing comes to play. And it was, I think, more of a coincidence, but it works really, really well with this use case. Actually, the way that Acto handles talking to a database is brilliant for this. Because, and again, this is where Ruby comes to play. If you guys have ever seen Active Record, what you do is you say, user, give me all your entities. So you call basically the database call on the user. There's no data, the database is completely abstracted away from you. It's within the model that you're performing on. Active does it a different way. And at the, at the beginning, at the beginning, it felt kind of weird to me that I had to like do something on the repository, on the actual database with like the queries. But if you look here, it actually works really, really, really nicely if you have different databases and masters and slaves are actually different databases that you read and write from. So what I do, obviously you have to write to the master. Like the master is the only one that allows you to change stuff. Um, so the master repo, you do an insert and then uh, put in whatever model attributes you have. But if you want to query for something, if you just want to read data, you can create a query like that, and I hope you, all of you can read that, and then you execute that query on a repo that you specifically call. You can say slave repo all. And you can see that it's super straightforward at this point to not just go slave, slave repo, but do like an enum rand, which we're going to have in a few months at Elixir, or you build it yourself. Uh, so I can actually have a pool of different slave databases and execute the query on. You can even go as far as to use pool boy or something like that to like maintain a pool of slaves. Now, don't confuse that with a pool that a database connection has anyway. So even if you just connect to one database, you have a pool of, pool of connections. But with this, and with the way that Ecto is designed and that has repo living next to the query and makes these two separate things, you can actually go ahead and like be very specific of where you're going to send that query. And that worked out perfectly for what we were trying to do, because this allows us to scale linearly. If I ever go into a bottleneck where reading from a database um, is, is where my where app goes slow, I just add a couple of more slaves, add them to that pool, and I can scale up as much as I want. And that's really, really helpful if you're trying to do something like that in real time uh, on web scale. So, 
Up until this point, I hope I motivated a little bit why I was using that stack. And like I said, I'm not going to lie to you, I really wanted to use Elixir, and that's like one of the big reasons that I came up with all these excuses to use it. But it turned out that it was actually a very good, good idea, and it worked out perfectly for us. And if there's one thing that I want, to, want you to take away from this talk, then all the concurrent stuff that you can do with Phoenix and with Elixir, and Phoenix for me is a big part of this too, so thank you very much, Chris, for writing it. Uh, all the concurrent stuff is really amazing, but even for like traditional web applications, where Ruby on Rails would normally be your go-to stack if you were like me, um, it makes a lot of sense, and there's a lot of things in the language that I'm going to talk about later on as well, that make it really, really good fit for it. Now, in all fairness, it was at all peaches and cream. Um, like every time you're trying something new, um, there were hurdles that we had to overcome. And what I want to do now is I want to talk to you about those hurdles, about the problems that we encountered, and how we solved them. And the reason I want to do that is maybe you're thinking about writing a project in Phoenix and Elixir, and maybe you're afraid that there might be things coming up, and there will. Um, and maybe I can take away some of those fears by just showing you yeah, we had that, and there was a really straightforward way to solve it. So, the first big hurdle, and the um, title of those slides is always just like the, the hurdle that we have, over, have to overcome. It's the maturity of Elixir. And that's a little bit unfair, and I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but you have to really keep in mind that uh, Bleach Report is a big corporation. Um, a language that hasn't been stable for that more than six months is not necessarily something that makes everybody feel super comfortable. Um, actually, when I started that project, Alex was like 0.8, and they were like, that's very young to put a lot of our money and trust in. Um, a problem that results from that is there's few software as a service integration points. And we heard about that already over the last couple of hours, days. Uh, error tracking and another big topic that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But just like software as a service with Ruby, you get all of these software as a service tools that you can plug in into the app that you're writing, and it's all just there, and you just pay a bunch of money to a bunch of people, and it all works, um, ideally. Um, with Elixir, the, the, off, the offering of the software as a service ecosystem is obviously not quite there yet. It's not quote-unquote proven like Ruby and Node, um, that's the immaturity that we're talking about. And there's things like no official Docker images. And we're using Docker to deploy. There's tons of images out there. I ended up writing my own image, and it took me all about 20 minutes, because it's really straightforward to look what other people have done. But it's just like small pain points that, that we encountered when we did it. Um, now, I'm going to keep saying that I'm going to come back to this. So just bear with me for a minute. Small ecosystem. Um, I might have mentioned that I have a Ruby background. Um, this is a chart that shows like all the different GitHub repos and how active they are. And you can see that Ruby is up there, uh, JavaScript is at the very top. Um, there's a lot of repositories, a lot of things going on. And obviously, for a language that is as young, Elixir is not on that list yet. And I do, I do think that that's going to change eventually. but. When you start doing something, you have to look at the status quo at the current situation. Um, what we don't want to do is we don't want to replicate existing functionality. I don't want to have to write like another user authentication scheme. Uh, I especially don't want to write hard things like encryption. Um, that's something that I really don't want to have to deal with, especially not if I try to get a product out that's time critical. Um, so there was this fear of like I have to do all of these things myself. Um, and this fear of like, there are really big problems that I have to solve. Like look at databases and stuff like that, talking to them, getting data in and out of them. That, those are complex things. And we were afraid that Elixir wasn't there yet to solve these things for us. Training developers, it's a big topic for us. We operate in San Francisco. San Francisco is extremely competitive when it comes to finding developers. And there is a good chance, this is by the way the scene of Silicon Valley, if you've noticed. Uh, I might be violating some copyrights here. Um, there's a good chance that you won't just be able to hire rockstar engineers that can do it all. So you'll have to train them. 
that's easy if they come from a Ruby background and you're a Ruby shop and there's lots of Ruby material out there. Um, like I said, San Francisco is one hell of a market and I'm, I'm already hearing recruiters be like, hey, you guys need an Elixir developer, okay, let, let's find someone with six years of development experience. <laughs> Good luck with that. Maybe Josie. Um, that would be the extensive list of people who would fit that criteria, I think. And this is probably the biggest problem we've encountered. And I was really happy to hear a couple of other talks um, over the last two days mentioning the same problem. For me, that was probably the biggest pain point. Like, all of these other things are not ideal, and I'm going to talk about in a minute how we address them. Monitoring was like the thing that had me worried most, because in Rubyland, I'm used to having tools like New Relic and um, Skylight, and you add one gem to your gem set, you give it an API key, and you get this, which is like a graph and insight and how much time do I spend in database. And monitoring is extremely important if you're running a web application. Um, whenever we have a downtime, monitoring is the first thing I check. I go to our dashboards and I see, do we have a spike in database response times? That would mean that the database is uh, buckling under the load. Um, do we, did we ship code and the Ruby um, execution time went through the roof? That means that we did something stupid in Ruby and that's got to be fixed. Uh, whenever you encounter problems, and you will, even in a fault tolerant language, you need to have insights to quickly um, narrow the field of things that you have to look at to find and fix the problem. So if you don't have them, you're flying blind. And it's super hard to debug things. So, I hope I have everybody feel really good about Phoenix applications and Elixir applications. Now, the reason that I showed you all of these problems is because uh, I encountered them, and if you start a project in it, you might encounter them as well, but we also find solutions for them, or found out that the fears that we had were actually unfounded. And I'm going to talk about each slide that we looked at and tell you what um, solutions we have to that. Um, there you go. So the immaturity of Elixir. Well, yeah, the language is only six years, a six month old, six years, six month old. But the tooling around it is amazing. Like you have a better package manager and dependency management than Ruby. I'm sorry, but I'm going to say that Mix and Hex solve the problem better than Button Lab ever did. Um, you have a testing framework that works, works really well with XUnit and comes built into the language. There's amazing testing frameworks out there already that you can also use, like Shudder and, and other tools I'm not mentioning right now. You have the Hex Package Manager, which is, it was there like one month or two months after Elixir went 1.0. Like you already have a website to host all of these dependencies and to deal with it. You have code documentation tools with Xdoc. There's just so many things and such a mature tooling that's also built, already built into the language that a lot of the very mature languages didn't have for a long time or still don't have. So even though it is a young language, it is not fair to call it immature. Um, Elixir hasn't been proven. Nobody has written big apps in it. That's not true, by the way. I heard about a lot of production apps, but it's not as proven as Ruby that everybody has been using. Well, but Erlang has. Like, the whole thing is built on Erlang, and the Erlang VM has been around as long as I have. Um, so that's saying something. It's been proven in telephone systems, and it's been proven in things that are way more complex than what I wanted to do with it. And Basically, the credibility that Erlang has, and I don't think that you ever have to argue about that, uh, basically lends to Elixir because you don't have a new uh, foundation that everything runs on. You just have an awesome new interface that uses this really proven uh, technology. Um, there are production uh, projects, and actually um, the, the Martins uh, that have been using Elixir were really reassuring for me because they had uh, systems out there that were running in production that were going very, very smoothly. So there is examples of successful deployments to the web. It's not all just hypothetical. There's actually software out there that runs and it's fine. You can all breathe easy now. Um, even if there's something missing, um, the architecture, the whole thing was, and that's, that's Elixir, that's 
um, Phoenix, uh, Spectral, everything has been written in a way that it's super easy to just extend it to your needs. Like, even if there's something that doesn't quite work right yet, and I'm, I'm going to give you an example in a minute of that, it's super easy to, to come over that and, and fix it. Last but not least, I'm, there's extremely smart people in the community. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but if you go into a Ruby channel and you're looking for help, then let's just say that the quality of answers is very mixed. Um, the help that I got with my Phoenix problems were like spot on right away. And, uh, it's just the, the extent of help and people working with it um, makes it a lot easier to overcome problems if you have them. Small ecosystem. I, I talked about the small ecosystem, right? Well, you have the Erlang ecosystem at your disposal. There's a lot of things that I didn't find as Elixir packages yet, but you can interface with Erlang, and there's a lot of stuff out there for Erlang already. Um, one of the things that I can think of at the top of my head was a OAuth authentication library, and I think I just saw a package on HexPM for that too, but at the time I needed it, it wasn't there, but it was there for Erlang, so I could just use that. And there's a rich ecosystem of Erlang packages that you can use in your Elixir applications. Um, Phoenix is an incredibly well-designed web framework and it solves like the biggest pain point that I would have writing myself. Like it has routers and models and views and um, a, a really um, sophisticated routing system. I'm not even using Phoenix channels. Um, I'm channels, not channels. Channels. And uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, there's great packages for like your standard use cases already. HTT Poison. Um, just poison XBCR, which is like a fairly specific problem. Like you have to do API requests in your tests and you want to record and replay the answer to those tests. Like that's fairly specific, but you still have a pro package there already that works. And I'm mentioning, I'm not mentioning a lot of other great packages. So yes, the ecosystem is still kind of small, but there's still a lot of packages out there, either early or already Elixir packages to choose from. There is not as many people working on it, and, but I'm going to drive that home po point home. I had that on the previous slide as well. The people that do work on it are pretty good. So while you might find more GEMs, they might not be all that good. The Elixir packages, are, I, I haven't seen a better one that I've worked with yet. And lastly, you have an extremely helpful community. Um, I had a problem with like uh, data that you sent to the server was in a JSON type, but it wasn't decoded as JSON because um, it didn't say application slash JSON as a data type or something else. And it took uh, Josie two minutes to fix that and push it to the master branch of Phoenix so I could use it. And that's amazing. Um, and then that, that's what I teased before. There was a problem that um, wasn't solved already for me, but due to the architecture, it was really easy for me to solve it myself. And that's uh, trading formats. In uh, Rails, the way that you negotiated um, your content type used to be host slash resource and then, for example, dot JSON. So the dot JSON tells the server, hey, I expect a JSON response. Or you do dot XML or dot HTML. Um, Phoenix didn't understand that and didn't want to understand it because it's actually not a very good way to negotiate what content you want to have. But I still needed to maintain uh, compatibility with those APIs that did it that way. Um, so all I had to do is write this little plug, and you can see it's 18 lines of code. I hadn't written a plug before, and it was really, really straightforward to just split the last part of that string. I used that as the format and just put it into the params of the connection, because in Phoenix you can give it a um, format param with, for example, JSON and XML. And then just continue that call chain of plugs. And another amazing thing for me as a Ruby developer is I'm, I'm used to middlewares, which is kind of a similar concept, but every middleware that you introduce slow down your app because you expand the stack trace and you have to go through all the different middlewares. Plugs are being compiled and other than what this code that's running and super straightforward, you don't really introduce all that much overhead. So the point I'm making here is there were things that were missing but it, due to the architecture of everything that was out there, it was super straightforward for me to just attach these things to my app and I had them at my disposal. 
And I also have to show code because this is an engineer conference after all. Um, training new developers. Well, we found out a couple of things. First, Elixir is different from Ruby, and all of you probably know that. And Dave Thomas made a great had a great talk about like how you shouldn't just do it the same way that Ruby does it. But the fact that the syntax is so very similar to what you already have, it actually lowers like the perceived entrance barriers for engineers. And I think for new languages that might be the biggest problem. Engineers being like, oh, this is all new to me, and this doesn't look the way that I'm used to code looking like, and especially with junior engineers, they're like, all right, I'm out. And just the fact that um, the syntax, and there's obviously other reasons to have it that way, but just the fact that the syntax looks very Ruby-like, people were like, yeah, I understand what's going on there. I, I know that, that is, that's a function definition, like I've seen all of that. And that really helped us train uh, engineers and one way of training them was just giving them a ticket and be like, figure it out. Obviously, you want to have a small ticket and the scope shouldn't be abroad, but just the fact that the language looks very similar made it easier for people to get it. There's excellent learning materials out there, and I think that's a very, very important point because you can teach people, but they have to learn and read up themselves. And elixirlang.org has a fantastic walkthrough tutorial of how the different data types work. You have Elixir Zips, which is amazing to just like keep it fresh and like see somebody else doing it and then replicating that. And then obviously Dave Thomas's book. Like it was there when Elixir was released, and it's an incredibly good book about the language. So that's a very, very rich resource to have if you're training new engineers. We found out that the fact that we're using a new language and a new ecosystem is actually a really good thing to hire engineers. Because at the end of the day, you want to offer them something. You want to be like, yeah, we're not just another Ruby shop, and you're going to do the same thing that you've been doing the last three years over and over again. You actually have something where like, this sets us apart. And we had a lot of um, people coming to us looking for a job and being like, yeah, we read that you guys are doing Elixir, and that's super interesting, and we kind of like, want to learn it. And that was the reason we got to talk to them. And like I said, in San Francisco, engineers coming to you is a big deal. Um, Measures, uh, what did we do to train them? Like I said, we started with easy tickets and gave them to people and be like, figure it out, and they did. Good job, Eddie. Um, but we also had live coding sessions, and it worked really well. I just sat in a room and started like doing stuff and talking out loud why I, why I was doing what I was doing, and it had two benefits. People like understood like concepts like pattern matching way easier by watching, watching me apply them. And I started thinking about my code, which was a good thing for the code. Um, so explaining yourself while you're programming is good for yourself. It actually also worked really nicely in training new engineers. Let's come to the biggest problem. Lack of monitoring. Um, that was like the thing that I was afraid of most. So there is a, a Google Erlang manager that like, lets you kind of record some requests to Neuralic. It doesn't really work all that way, and I didn't want to base our monitoring, our lifeline, on something that wasn't officially supported and that was actually condemned by New Relic. Like there's a form of, uh, bulletin board entry somewhere where they say, yeah, we don't support that, we don't encourage people to use it. Um, so that wasn't really reassuring about the whole, like, uh, I've got to have monitoring. Um, and Skylight.io, like I said, is a great app, doesn't work. So you have to build it yourself. And that is surprisingly straightforward. And actually, for me, the turning point was the same Erlang factory that I talked about in Berlin, where I saw a talk by Brian Troutwine from Admiral, who was like, oh, let me talk about how we monitor our apps. We use Exometer. And he had like an amazing walkthrough. And I was like, well, the cool kids are using it, so I want to use it myself. And I integrated Exometer in our app. and. Um, it's, there is so many things that work really, really well. So for example, if you collect a couple of thousand calls every second, um, you don't want to push those statistics to a data collection endpoint right away because you're introducing a lot of network traffic, traffic just to push log messages and stat messages. So I kind of steered away from using straight stats D and pushing every event in a stats D server. Uh, what Exometer lets you do is like collect all these entries in memory in 
the Erlang VM and then aggregate them before you send them out. <coughs> and there's a very few, there's a very slim chance that you ever need metrics that are more granular than down to the second. But collecting 10,000 calls and putting them together to one data point vastly reduces the load of your application. You don't want monitoring to bring down your main product. That's not what it's there for. And by uh, sending all of these stats uh, every time a call has been made, we, it didn't work out well for us, let's just say that. We do use StatsD to then send the, stat, uh, the, the statistics from Exometer uh, to our backends. And that's actually, again, it was suggested by Brian, and I went with it, and it's a great idea. Because there are so many great tools out there already that integrate with StatsD. Um, if you want to have a uh, quick time to market, you use a software as a service like Datadog, Librato, there's a couple of other out there that I'm not mentioning, I'm not getting paid by them for mentioning them. Um, StatsD allows you to just um, have a very like open stat collecting and um, monitoring way of doing it, and you can host it yourself too. So Exometer in, com uh, in, in uh, combination with StatsD is actually a really good way to measure your app and I ended up liking it more than everything that a software as a service ever did for us. Because you can do more. The Erlang VM is amazing about sharing information on itself. It tells you how, many, how much memory it has allocated for atoms and binaries and processes. And there's a vast, um, vast amount of data of your Erlang VM uh, that tells you how it's doing right now that actually lets you anticipate failures. If you're seeing that one of the memory allocation graphs go up, you have a problem, you can actually intervene before your app goes down. And on top of that, you can also take uh, statistics like CPU load, memory, uh, available disk space, all of those um, measures that tell you how well your server is doing, and you can have all of these statistics, all of that data, in like the same data pipeline and you can display it side by side and I'm going to show you in a minute that it actually gives you a very very good overview of like how healthy your app is. So to recap, here's what I'm interested in to see if my app will live longer for the next five minutes. Uh, DB queries per minute, am I starting to call the database with a lot of DB queries, where are they coming from? And how fast are they getting <coughs> replied to you? Web requests per minute. If my app goes down and I saw a search in web traffic, then maybe I'm not scaling all that well. Uh, and how, much, how fast am I responding to those web requests? And then, at the end, health of the react. Just like general feel-good measures to see how are we doing. And that's how it ended up looking like um, on a dashboard for one of our apps. And this is by far not all the data that I have at my disposal. This is just a quick glance overview of how am I doing right now. And you can see in top left, uh, you have average response time. It's a nice flat graph, we're happy. I'm a happy trooper, to quote. Um, and you can see that it's actually kind of high, like it's 100 milliseconds for a Phoenix app that's ridiculously slow. Awesome. Um, you can see that the reason is that the average app query execution time on the right hand side is pretty much the exact same number. So we end up adding one millisecond per call to the query execution time. What? Um, this is my development laptop and I was pounding it with requests. Normally, this is a lot faster. The app that I was measuring here in production has an average response time of 15 milliseconds and we're loading live data. Um, requests per minute, again, like if that's searching, surging, then you know a lot of people are accessing our site right now. It's just nice to have all of these measures side by side so you can see if something goes wrong, what goes wrong and where. And then you have memory usage here, this is also what you want to see. Nice flat graphs, there's nothing spiky, so I'm not allocating memory and leaking it. Um, this is the early VM run queue, so how many messages are currently waiting to be processed. This is also, it's a little bit spiky, but that's because it was my laptop, and you can actually see it never went over eight things that want to run. So this is all peaches and cream. We're very happy. And then you see system load on the side. So there's all this data that I can collect and that I can uh, put in uh, context with what I'm doing right now in my, in my web application. And it's all there at my disposal. And I'm going to say that again, 
I was super afraid of the lack of monitoring. I used a talk that was 45 minutes in Berlin and integrated Exometer. And now I have something that I actually like better than a lot of the software as a service tools I had at my disposal before. And um, I do intend to write a couple of gists and blog posts about how to integrate those statistics. And you'll have to just trust me at this point when I'm saying it was really not that, uh, not that hard. It was very straightforward. Exometer is a little bit complex to understand in the beginning, but once you get like the concept, it's super straightforward to integrate. Now there's a couple of like ongoing challenges that I'm still looking at. I'm working with Ecto and Phoenix. They are not 1.0 yet, so there are sometimes changes that make me have to change my code, which I hate. Um, now seriously, there was there was a couple of things that were bre breaking changes where I had to change it, but that's expected with software that's pre 1.0, and it was never that bad. Like it was amazing how stable. Uh, the team kept Phoenix and Ecto, uh, and how little change it actually required to um, go up to next um, versions of it. Um, I want to spread the word. I want to have more people understand how amazing this is and how well it works. And like I said, I hope I was able to prove to you that it even works well for just like standard web applications. I'm not using web sockets here. Like this is not a very Elixir specific applications is very standard and it still um, helped me a lot to use this new language and these new tools. Um, it would be awesome if some of the software, some of the things that we did were as software as a service and just there for people who want to and, and teams who want to get started with it. And uh, there's a couple of ops challenges and I have them on my gotcha slide. Um, we went with a standard Nginx configuration of Amazon and it crashed. <laughs> because the problem is that the Erlang VM is too stable. Um, I was able to open up connections and connections and connections, and Erlang was just like, that's all you got? Well, Nginx ran out of file descriptors. Um, <laughs> we never had that problem in Ruby. Like, Ruby would go, up, go down before Nginx did. Uh, anyways, there is a uh, worker R limit, no file, which limits the number of file descriptors that Nginx is opening up, and then there's a the number of worker processes that Nginx ha has that you can limit. So you might want to look at those configuration values and not just go with the standard. Um, watch file descriptors, that's what happened. Um, it's, I think it's a fairly standard Erlang problem, like you can do so many things at the same time while your OS can't. Like there's a fixed number of open ports that you can have, afterwards the OS is done, it says that's done. The funny thing is, if you have exhausted all of your file descriptors, you can't SSH into it anymore. So, um, that's a problem. Watch your log files. Um, turns out Amazon is capturing the standard in from Docker and writing it to a non rotated log file. It took us only five hours to exhaust all the disk space that we had with that one log file. We went down. Um, this is this was mentioned earlier, and it's super stupid, but I did it. I converted user input to Adam. Yeah, that's not a good idea. Um, we have a patch for it. <laughs> <they're good. laughs> Thank you, I need that. Um, actually, the monitoring that we just saw, one of the statistics that I collect is how much memory do I allocate for atoms. I kind of want to have that, a flat line. If you don't do it, there's a good chance you're doing the same mistake that I did. Um, this is a DAW for everybody who has like an uh, early background or more than a month of Elixir experience. But I found out that using OTP, even within a web server, is a really good idea. There's a lot of things that help you if you use OTP. My example was I'm talking to RabbitMQ, and I started doing that out of every request that came in. Well, file descriptors. I was opening up a bunch of uh, connections to RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ was fine with it. The early game was fine with it. The OS didn't like it. So I created an OTP app that handles the communication with RabbitMQ, and then I communicate through that OTP app, and it kind of like throttles the amount of what it keeps a consistent amount of connections open to, open to RabbitMQ. So use OTP. Um, and then there is Erlang binary data collection. I'm not going to go into that too much, but you are probably producing JSON responses. Those are big blobs of binary data. If you uh, send them around between processes, just be, be aware that Erlang has a particular way of collecting that 
memory back, and it sometimes doesn't work as well. So I know this is a very unsatisfactory explanation of what's going on, but just have that in the back of your mind when you're sending binary between processes. We are almost at the end. Results. What did I gain? Well, I'm going to go ahead and say I wouldn't have been able to build this in Ruby. The concurrency that's going on, the real time, the scalability, we have a lot of experience scaling Ruby, but it almost always entails having some kind of caching in between. And like I hope you understand, like I hope I was able to convey earlier, didn't work for us. It worked extremely well with Phoenix and Elixir. We have the very complex merge lists. We um, send them back in less than 15 milliseconds. Um, and it actually turns out that a simple list is 30 milliseconds, so you can see that like the the difference between a simple response and a complex response is not even double in size. So even though I'm doing like five times as many things, like the simple list has to be built for the complex list as well, right? So it's part of that. And I'm building not one but five, and I'm doing that all at the same time, and it turns out the response times are nearly the same. And a lot of that time spent waiting for Postgres to send me data. Um, we have, and I'm kind of patting my own shoulder here, but that's just the way it's going to be. We have a very high uh, test coverage and very, very maintainable code. That's not because I did it, it's because I had a tool set that allowed me to do it. Like all of those Ecto upgrades and Phoenix upgrades were very straightforward because I just changed it, waited till all my tests were green again. This is standard for somebody who comes out of Rubyland, or it should be, um, but there's a lot of other languages out there that don't have that kind of ecosystem, that don't allow you to write all of these tests in such a straightforward way, and that's a really big deal if you're working with a lot of uh, people on a big um, web project. So very high test coverage, very, very maintainable to code. We don't have runtime numbers anymore because the compiler catches most of them. That's amazing if you come from a scripting language. And it's extremely stable. We weren't able to send so many requests to it that it would go down. Everything else would, like the entire thing would fall apart. But the Phoenix app itself was just cruising along, being like, yep, that's all you got. Um, and then again, if you scale up the database by slave reads, you can make that actually perform as well. Um, I got to make the point that a functional programming language like Elixir is perfect for standard web applications, like I just explained one. And the reason that I'm saying that is functional programming languages normally work in a way where you put data in, in one end, and you do a bunch of processing, and you spit data out at the other end. Like that's, if I understand correctly, functional programming in a nutshell for you. Turns out that a web application is just that. You put in a request on the one hand, and you return a response on the other hand, on the other hand and I want to have for the same request, the same response every time. And that's very testable. So for me as a Ruby developer, the thing that probably I enjoyed most was the testability of the code that I wrote, because functional programming languages are extremely easy to test, because there's no side effects within a function. And therefore, it's perfect for web applications, because you always have this um, request response cycle. And I'm not saying that it's not perfect for all of the other things that you're seeing. It's obviously well suited for that as well. But it's also suited for good old just re re request response cycle web applications. So, using Phoenix, using Elixir, using Ecto, using that incredible ecosystem around it, allowed us to build that product. And it was built fast, it's secure, it's reliable, and I am very convinced that even though I had to learn to program in Elixir and figure all of the problems out that you just saw, um, I wouldn't have been able to do it at the same time for Ruby. Last slide. First point, most important, I'm not very smart. Um, if I can do it, everybody else can. This, I guarantee you that. So, what did I do to get it done? Um, I used the Elixir Link channel, I used the Google Groups, um, the documentation of the resources around it are amazing, and all of these things you have, to have, you have at your disposal. And if there's one thing that I want to like give away as a message, it's like, don't he hesitate to ask questions. I asked the stupidest questions, and everybody was always super nice and responded and solved the problems for me. So, using Phoenix, using Elixir uh, as our stack, allowed us to build this product. 
Um, it worked really well, and it is, this entire talk was pretty much just a sales pitch for go ahead and use it. I can highly recommend it. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Oh, any questions? Welcome as well. Yeah. Um, how did you do exception monitoring? For exception monitoring, yes. um, there's two things. Um, one, we don't have many exceptions. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> um, it turns out that having a stable language produces way less exceptions because the code is way more predictable. Um, we uh, right now have a log file analyzer that just looks for them and sends us to them because there's about one a day, so that works fine. Um, I did see uh, that there's a plug that catches errors and then uses, I think, bug snag um, for error collection. So there's a bug snag um, plug that you can just put into your um, list of plugs that will collect those errors for you and send them to bug snag. I will probably do that at some point, but I just didn't need to at this point. <laughs> and that's again, not because I wrote clean code, but because the Erlang ecosystem just makes it really easy to write code that doesn't crash. You should make it crash as well, but then fix it. Like, exactly, yeah, or if it crashes, it's fine. Yeah, so it's slightly, you should probably go down to zero a day soon. Any other questions? There are quite a few, yeah. Um, I, we don't have a, uh, authentication or that kind of authentication, <laughs> that, but I saw that there is a plugin for Phoenix that gives you pretty much device-like authentication with all the routes and all the controllers and all the views. Um, so there is like a device clone, and I'm probably doing it injustice by calling it a device clone, um, for Phoenix out there already. But yeah, Joe is probably more suited to answer that question than I am. <laughs> Uh, Docker. Right now, um, all of the cool things that we heard about, like XRM and hot code reloading, all that, we don't really have to do that because um, we can just we have a load balancer and we can just swap out what's going on in the back end. We don't have persistent connections. I'm not saying that it's not a good idea to maybe do it not regardless, but right now we just have Docker images that we spin up and then we um, reconfigure the load balancer to pick up those new Docker instances. I just want to make uh, one comment about uh, authentication. So, uh, as soon as I find some free time, I, if, it's, if it's some first class uh, package isn't available, I do plan on writing one. Um, but just like the Android client, like, I also don't plan on writing one. So, I think that the, the community will produce a very good option um, very in the future. Uh, otherwise, I will uh, be something soon. Right. And like I, said, I think I saw something already that just plugs into Phoenix and gives you like everything that you need for authentication. And it's super straightforward to write an authentication plug too. Like we have our custom way of authenticating uh, service-oriented architecture requests. You know what I'm saying. Um, and I, I, I just I just wrote a plug for it, and it was it, it's like I said, this architecture that everything's been built on just allows you to do these things really, really straightforward with very little pain. Anyone else? Front. You mentioned code quality and coverage. Like, uh, how do you measure that? Um, there is, I think there's even a coveralls pl plugin, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there is definitely a, uh, a code coverage me measurement uh, package. Uh, I have forgot what it's named like. Yes, Josie? So, uh, an Excel sheet with one. So if you do this fast, dash dash over, it generates some. Right. But they're not the. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat that because I'm not sure that everybody understood it. So um, the thing that I thought was a hex package, hex package is actually built into the language. So mix comes with a task, a mix ta test dash dash coverage. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, mix test dash dash coverage will give you a code coverage report. Um, if it's not nice enough for you, there's coverless integration or something like that. Um, actually, the way with 
documentation-driven development that it's kind of possible with Elixir. I ended up like writing the tests and the documentation for write wrote the function. So, but so I never really had to like go back and, and write tests for missing pieces of code because I always tested them first and then wrote them. Um, but yeah, there's there's tools on that. But loving all those questions. Thank you for that. Uh, do you want to write every own next application in Elixir instead of Rails? And if that's if if no, if it's because of the lack of libraries, then another question: If we had all those libraries that we're still missing in uh, Elixir, then would you actually switch to Elixir and Phoenix in every other case? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I I was about to repeat that question, which is stupid because you had a microphone. Um, <laughs> The answer is that I just started a company with a couple of friends and I kind of want that company to be successful and I put all of our backend services in Phoenix and Elixir. So um, that pretty much answers your, that answers your question. Um, the reason is that the lack of packages was never a problem. Um, it is awesome to have as many packages as Ruby does and I'm looking forward to having more Phoenix packages, and, sorry, more Elixir packages. Um, but it was never big enough of a hurdle to make me want to go back. And I still love Ruby and Rails. I think it's great software that can do great things with it. Parts of our new system is in Rails. We have the user authentication service in, in Rails because we have a service-oriented architecture. We get to pick and choose every piece, of, a language for every piece of the architecture. And it was just at the time more straightforward to use Rails for user authentication, but it's like 2% of the entire stack that we have. Everything else is Phoenix. Okay, one last question. A, a note on, on libraries and things like that. I think, I think in the Erlang community and also in Lipsia, you should actually be grateful for not having many libraries because it's a signal that you don't need to write as much code you have three it's just the language that provides everything and you're happy. It's that's a code you don't have to write, that's the best lines of code in the, in the world. That's very true. Um, and that's a good closing argument. Uh, most of the things that I would need as packages in Ruby are already part of the language in Elixir. And um, the packages that are out there are just so good that we don't need more, many of them. We just need good ones and we have those already. Thank you very much.